Is Google's Pixel 7a a winner? And how is Australia's federal budget fighting cybercrime? And are blue skies already turning grey over at Blue Sky? Hey there, welcome back to Vertical Hold Behind the Tech News, the award-winning tech podcast where we catch up with Australia's leading technology journalists and commentators to dive into the big tech news of the week. I'm Adam Turner and I'm joined as usual by Alex Kidman, a man who is 68 millionth in line for the throne. Now, Alex, if you get the call up, what would be your first decree as king? Look, you put me in a difficult position here, Adam, because a very, very large part of King Alex wants to abolish the monarchy entirely. I think it's entirely archaic. But if we do have to have a king, and a lot of people think we do, then I want to return to good old-fashioned king values and be completely insane about it. Declare a cassowary to be Prime Minister of Australia. Have all people who produce eggplant beheaded within the first week of my reign. Basically, I'm not looking to be king for a very long time. I'm looking to give people really clear reasons to abolish the monarchy. All right, so not king for a long time, but a good time. Absolutely. We're also joined once again by the one and only Stilgarian. Still, what would be your first decree, decree upon taking the throne? I would ban avocado, the devil's slime fruit. Ooh, controversial, controversial. It's I love horrible. it. Horrible. It is just slightly condensed mucus. Whilst we think about which foodstuffs will survive the revolution, <laughs> Still's here because the Australian federal budget has dropped and it's getting tough on cybercrime. Oh, Plus, yes. there's a few things threatening to rain on Blue Sky's parade. And then we'll come to grips with the new Pixel 7a smartphone. But first, Still, the budget. Many things went down. What caught your eye from a tech perspective? Well, uh, there's an awful lot of online safety stuff. We have uh, online safety, we have cybersecurity, we have a lot of stuff going in there. And what I found interesting is that there's a lot of money being spent because, clearly because of the Optus data breach last year. Mm. Um, There was a lot of announcements made. We need some things happening there. What's confusing me, though, is that there are now going to be so many agencies involved with fighting scams and the cybers, particularly the Australian Communications and Media Authority, ACMA, I call it. They'll get cranky if you call it that. They want to say they are the ACMA. Get over it, people. But they will now have regulatory power to somehow prevent scams online. So scams and misinformation and disinformation, well, misinformation is content, but scams are now content, which is intriguing. Uh, depending be- on yeah, depending on where you get your content from, that may have been true for a very long time. <laughs> this is the same old problem of treating the internet as if it's broadcast television. Now, if someone on TV yeah. runs a program that's a scam, all right, that's misleading content. You get them under the Broadcasting Services Act or the pay TV equivalent and all of that. But this is this is content, and that we already have plenty of people dealing with scams. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC, they run Scam Watch. They treat scams as ripping off consumers. The Australian Securities and Investment Commission, which is about how you run companies and shares and things like that, they have their own way of dealing with scams because it's a crime. The federal police chase scams because it's a crime. The state police forces uh, chase crimes. And then you also have at the Australian uh, Cybersecurity Centre dealing with the cybers more generally. You have their report cyber program to report cyber crime. So we have an awful lot of people doing a lot of overlap. And we saw some um, some numbers come out of the uh, Australian um, uh, Institute of uh, Criminology just in the last few days, pointing out that most of the reports of cyber crime and other such things to 
uh, the ACSC one and others, and onto a, yet another report the cybers. Most of them aren't followed up by the police because, like, the police have got a lot of things to do. Um, well, I, I would have <laughs> thought the uh, the other classic problem here is if I were a scammer. I'd have to be pretty dumb to be operating out of Australia where I would presume most of these forces would have the strongest regulatory powers. Well, that's Isn't right. This we, kind we, of, yeah. We do have the power, or the I should say the Federal Police have the power. I don't I don't have the power, and I don't think you do either, um, to coordinate with police forces in other nations. But the whole deal mm. about uh, MLAT, the Mutual Legal Assistant Treaties, that we have with various countries. The convention is that whatever you're trying to chase up has to be a crime in both countries. Yeah, so which makes sense. If, yeah. If So if if the special branch of the Royal Thai Police Force comes to the Australian Federal Police and says, oi, that person in Sydney said nasty things about the king, the Australian <laughs> Federal Police will say, <laughs> so Good luck what? to him. <laughs> good, good luck. Yeah, that yeah. we have free speech here. Um, So it seems to me there's a lot of duplication. And although one approach is, well, if you have lots of different ways of attacking the problem, then maybe one of them will stick. But it does feel a little bit like throwing mud at the wall. So has this budget done anything to actually improve this situation? Has it just spread the money even further or has it sort of consolidated things? Has it put one organisation in charge? We will have a coordinating kind of thing to deal with scams. And, I, you know, I can't even be bothered looking up what it's called now. Because... Is it the National Anti-Scam Centre? Yeah, that'd be it. Yep. So, so well, NASC. Well, well, that... NASC. Yeah, yeah, well, what, what's that going to do? <laughs> that the ACCC isn't already doing or that the Australian Federal Police cybercrime people aren't already doing? And the answer is it'll be more bureaucrats sitting on top of all them writing reports. Yeah, it, 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 this, no. this isn't so going to be employment more... employment figures in Canberra. Hmm. Oh, you know, it's a struggling city and, you know, the public servants, you know, have had a lot of you know, job cuts over the years, so maybe, maybe that's what they need. I don't know. If only Koshi was alive to see all this, I'm sure he could help. <laughs> oh, look that one up yourselves, kids. Uh, that's 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 true. Um, I, this is also framed in terms of it being um, online safety. So the eSafety Commission is going to get a bit of money out of this. Uh, everyone gets a little bit of money um, for for more or fewer rather scams and spans coming from the portal. That's a that's an historical reference for. Those of you who might appreciate it. We've been around for long enough, yeah. Um, there's also funding, speaking of funding, because this is all about the budget, for small business um, security. And e easily my favourite term to come out of this budget, the cyber warden, which sounds like a Doctor Who villain giving the TARDIS a speeding ticket. Still, what's I'm... a small business cyber warden? Uh, look, there, there, there has been a pilot program. A small business cyber warden, and I can see where they're kind of going with this. The idea is that small business can't afford to have a dedicated cybersecurity person. Fair point. They probably don't even have a dedicated IT person these days because everything's up in the cloud. But what you will have is a nominated and trained somehow cyber warden, which will work like you have your fire warden or you have your occupational health and safety nominated person, or like a pub will have uh, an RSA marshal to just keep an eye on the rules and, and things in that. So the idea is you will have uh, a cyber warden, and the cyber warden will be a bit like, you know, the blackboard monitor at school. They'll, they'll make sure that, you, you know, you're doing all of your software updates, and if you are worried whether you're should click on a link. You ask them to have a look at it for you. Um, and I assume that if there is a cyber, that they sound an alarm of some kind, put on a, a yellow plastic hat and go to the <laughs> and intercom uh, and then evacuate everyone calmly from the internets. And you gather in the <laughs> car park. What would be the car park here? 
Um, you go via AOL, the canteen and get some AOL, dimsums. I suppose, <laughs> or CompuServe, maybe. I would have, I would have you... thought you'd have to gather in the underground car park where the Wi-Fi signal can't reach. Ah, so I the like internet this. can't get you. And and what you need is is not a hacker hoodie, hackery hoodpari in in Finnish because they have a word for it. Um, but you need one of those hoodies that, like scaffolders and painters, wear up top of tall buildings. Nice, thick, orange, high-vis hoodie with Cyber Warden written across the back. And a foil lining so you are your own yes. Faraday cage? Ah, now we're thinking. Yeah. A hoodie lined with tin foil. <laughs> You mentioned Look, earlier that they're not just talking about scams, they're also talking about misinformation and disinformation. That sounds to me like we're talking about certain foreign governments more than certain scammers. Well, you would think so, but it's it's more about the major platforms uh, redistributing this stuff. So now that um, – I mean, we, we have to – I mean, we're going to end up mentioning, twi- mentioning uh, Twitter at some point anyway, so let's mention it now. Given that Twitter has essentially got rid of – 90% of its trust and safety people and all of its staff in Australia. The question is now, um, who does the government talk to? Who does the e-safety commissioner talk to or, or the ACMA talk to to get rid of misinformation online? And so this will more be a regulatory thing to get some laws through and some money for public servants and lawyers to uh, give Twitter and Meta and uh, TikTok and all the others, a slap over the wrist with a limp lettuce to say, naughty, naughty, uh, you are telling people to huff ivermectin again. Uh, and that's that's not on. So we'll see what happens. I noticed that they were talking about, uh, there was a lot of things that got a lot of money thrown at them, some things that have been around for a while. They're, they're talking about mm-hmm. the next stage of the digital ID program. Where are we up to with digital ID at the moment? And where is, what does the next stage look like? Well, we currently have the uh, federal government talking to the state governments. Uh, there's an agreement certainly between the federal government and New South Wales to make their stuff interoperable. Uh, and Victoria is going to start coming in. Really, we're at the initial stage of working out what the next stage will look like. So this is this is actually kind of a, uh, you know, if you have opinions about this, this is a really good time to make them known to your local MP uh, or for uh, ID companies and biometric uh, companies to insist that the whole thing happens uh, and they get paid boatloads of money. Um, there's talk of it being some sort of digital ID in a wallet. And there will be a like a, a MyGov wallet, and that's the federal one. But if you have the New South Wales government wallet in the services NSW app, you can put, you know, your IDs in either, uh, and so on and so forth. It's it's at the kind of initial stages. Um, I have a slight conflict of interest here because I'm doing some consulting for some people who reckon that that's not quite enough. That you can hold up your digital ID and show it on your phone to someone and they can use their app to scan it and you both agree that that's all happening. But how does that then work online in all circumstances where the other human isn't there and so on? Um, that's that's the point we're at. We're working out how that will work. So just to, to clarify, when they talk about the digital ID program, they're not talking about a digital id a specific thing like an australia card or a medicare number or whatever they're uh, talking well, about a program I don't know. What's well that's the maybe yeah but but it sounds like what they mean by a digital id program is the infrastructure that, like wallets that let you store digital ids trustworthy tr- in a trusting way from different people rather than issuing everyone with a specific thing called a digital id is that that's how i yeah, understood yeah 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 the idea yeah. is that you know, you, you won't have to gather up all these different things. Like, for for example, you do that at the moment to get a login to MyGov to log into Centrelink or the 
the Australian uh, Taxation Office. But then MyGov ID is a separate thing again. That one's out of the tax office, actually, because MyGov's out of Services Australia, and they don't work quite the same way. Uh, and then if you say, well, I actually have a, a Western Australian driver's license, why can't I use that with Centrelink? Why can't I use this with that? Why do I have to keep telling the bank these other things? So it is a unified way of dealing with government IDs, the government does services. This, what, does this have the potential? Because one of the big problems with things like the Optus hack is people were showing them, you know, their Medicare card, their driver's license, their passport, whatever, and then they were just keeping copies of it forever. And the same with Latitude and the others. Does this lay the groundwork for when someone says, show me 100 points of ID, I can point them to this thing. They can see my driver's license, my passport. They can tick the box, but they don't get to keep a copy. Well, that's one of the big questions that's actually being worked out as we speak. You've, you've got the problem there. It doesn't really matter if I've got a, a, a digital version of my existing IDs. If the people verifying stuff is keeping copies of it, then we haven't gained anything. Yeah. Um, the idea is, that's right, you have some sort of cryptographic cleverness that's, that when you check online, you say, okay, this is the ID that the punter has shown to the system, and the system then says back, yes, that's correct, and here's a nice cryptographic thing that you can store which records the fact that we check this ID for you at this time in this way, and that number is no use because it's just an index back into our logs to say yeah. that this thing happened legitimately. So this is sort of mirroring the way that, and I was talking about this on last week's show, mirroring the, the whole passkeys approach in a way, a kind of yeah. half and half without everything, you can't do anything approach. That's right, and we've got similar systems already in, say, things like Apple Pay, where the vendor gets a code that says, yes, this was legitimately charged to this person against your record number at this time, and the money is all going to flow. But the vendor, the shopkeeper, doesn't know your credit card number, never sees it. So the Why same is it sort taking of thing so long? If, the, if we've always known that handing out your credit card is not such a good idea, so we'll use this in-between um, safety offer, whatever you want to call it. Why is it such a big deal to have to introduce it to other things as well? I mean, you're right. It is surprising given that the federal government, particularly in Australia, is so excellent at doing things with computers. <laughs> <laughs> it also comes down to, you know, who's going to run it? Like, We've only just in the last few months got the, the federal government and the New South Wales government to agree to work together. Yeah, I was going to say, I would have thought the other big problem is that we have lots of state and territory governments that all have to have their own either slice of the pie or interest or position or potentially bureaucrats of their own, different systems. It, it, it gets kind of complicated. Yeah, and if the federal government announces something, well, that's not a Victorian state government announceable. That's not something you, <laughs> that the Victorian government can you know, point to before their next election. Uh, and the same for all the other states. Now, it is easier now that all of the governments in Australia, except Tasmania, are Labor governments for the time being, because it's a bit easier for them to agree on doing stuff without quite as much point scoring. But because nobody that, within yeah. a political party ever argued with each other. No. Yeah, oh, yeah I see your point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and look, there are, there are you know, differences of opinion. Uh, there are organisations within the government that would like to have the ability to track all of these transactions to fight the cyber criminals. Uh, and there are other people, you know, who say, mate, privacy, no, we don't want all that logged. So that's uh, another angle to it as well, which raises the other point, you know, how much input will uh, privacy advocates and other human rights types and other civil society organisations have in designing this architecture? And that's, that's not sure yet. What I do find very interesting, though, is that all of the new money to work on this 
another ten million dollars odd next year to keep going with this. Nearly all of it went to the Department of Finance rather than the much loved Digital Trans uh, Digital Transformation Authority. Now that that is a signal that the Department of Finance is very much in charge of this rather than that that broad funnel to consulting firms at the DTA where money just flows out and you're never quite sure whether you're going to get value for money back in. Uh, it also indicates that uh, because finance is therefore more connect, connected with the Australian Taxation Office and others, they are uh, generally much better at computering than Services Australia. So that, that to me is a very good sign about what the next steps might be. So we've talked about the things that were in the budget, um, but clearly, aside from obviously the much-needed funds for the elimination of eggplant and possibly avocados, what was not in the budget from a tech sense that you would have liked to see still? I think what I'd like to see is less emphasis on the internet being totally evil and a thing we need to protect people from, and a bit more emphasis on how cool it is about the fact that we have the entire sum of all human knowledge uh, plus Nazis at our fingertips and how we might build this for a future. There wasn't really much more funding for STEM education, although though STEM's mm. not this, you know, education's not magical. All of the the kind of funding for education and building for the future is, is relatively uh, defence-specific. Submarines. Uh, nuclear energy. And um, job specific and industry specific so we're seeing some stuff you know for the the hydrogen economy and developing some things like the space and so on but all that's relatively small we have seen a hundred million odd uh thrown in the general direction of startups but we still have this idea that startups are some kind of magical solution to everything uh whereas quite frankly most stuff is just people plodding along and that's where the real growth comes from rather than the, the roll roll the dice and hope that again this random little company is suddenly worth billions of dollars if 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 i hear one more politician talk about atlassian and canva <laughs> i think i'll throw myself off my off my chair content warning uh, i i will be extremely upset enjoying the show that's great don't forget to subscribe, which you can do on every podcast platform you've ever heard of. Just search for Vertical Hold or go to our website, verticalhold.com.au, where we've got handy buttons for every single podcast platform. Well, speaking of startup companies, and before you throw yourself out of your chair, <laughs> we were also talking last week about Blue Sky, the much-hyped new Twitter alternative from, well, the people who bought you Twitter, basically. <laughs> uh, but it's not really all blue skies over there once you <laughs> dig beneath the code, is it? No. Look, last week uh, you guys and Zach had uh, you know, really quite a good rundown of what, what's been happening. But between then and now, it's got more mainstream media coverage. People have started looking at how it works and having a bit of a poke around. And, and that's where you suddenly get... Oh, oh my, yeah, maybe it's not so good. Now, I, I, I think one thing to to mention is that it still has, I think, less than a hundred thousand users. It was sixty five thousand the other day. Sixty, yeah, sixty five thousand is, is the figure I've seen in a couple of places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Very small beans. And one point eight million on the the waiting list to get an invite. So I, it's a nightclub. Did, well, yeah, 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 and it's all of that. <laughs> well, it's a nightclub, except it's still scaffolding, and the you know the painters are still coming through. And it'd be nice if the Sparkies finished wiring up the the, the sound system, uh, because I think they've gone to this. I mean, all right, they they say it's a you know it's beta, it's a public beta thing, but to have a social network without any means of blocking other users is you know, it's a bit like building a car without brakes. Um, what could possibly and, go wrong? Well, I That'll think a lot can two. go wrong, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> version two. Yeah. 
the thing is they're making the same problem that so many social networks make is that they two years ago when they installed her as CEO, Jay Gruber, she's she's a programmer, she's a developer. Now, now there's nothing wrong with being de- a developer, but you you know you're not just writing a, a fancy database. You're writing a media platform, and you can call it social media or social networking. It's messaging. It's all about the content. It's all about what happens. I mean, I w- I won't say that shunting around all these packets of data instantly amongst potentially hundreds of millions of users when it gets to that point, if it gets to that point. I'm not saying that's easy. Of course not. It's really, really hard. But someone like Elon Musk goes, oh, that's just engineering. That's just software. Um, Jay Gruber, uh, probably much, probably much the same. She's bringing a programmer's mindset to it. So the idea of you know how you deal with content moderation, well, that's just a software problem. How you deal with with everything else, a software problem. And we've we've seen some of the uh, uh, the the kind of moderation process become visible. They've got hold of some of the uh, the code up there on GitHub, or do we say GitHub? Um, and all of the content is being shoved out to a third-party service called the Hive.ai, which then classifies it and sends it back with a whole lot of tags. So the tags are, um, you know, yes, female nudity or yes, male nudity or yes, sexual activity. And you can say, well, that's it. They're things you look at the words or you look at the pictures, and that's a thing that AI can do to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, human corpse comes back, but then it comes back flagging, is it a Nazi? Is it the Ku Klux Klan? Is it a Confederate flag on the, uh, the thing and things like that? And we don't know exactly how they do this classification, although it's got a swastika on it, it's pretty obvious. And we don't know necessarily what uh, Blue Sky is doing with this. But what we have seen is that you can filter by these labels. So your content moderation is, oh, explicit sexual images. I can choose between show, warn, or hide. Other nudity, same. Spam, same. Although why you'd want to see all the spam, I don't know. Maybe you do. Political hate groups, show, warn, or hide. So again, the fact that a political hate group is organizing on your site is just seen as a, a matter of taste. So it's not a question of maybe we don't want Nazis here. It's just let's classify them as Nazis and move on. Put them in the Nazi yeah. box. Yeah, put them in the Nazi box. It strikes me, though, that all of this tagging also potentially allows Blue Sky to then say, well, you know, if this user is is consistently posting nudes, posting objectionable material, posting something that might be flagged, that's building a profile on them as well. I mean, that's got value to advertisers, doesn't it? Uh, you, you, I mean, yeah, only, just, only if you're selling oh, good, good know, heavens, pornography good or heavens. Nazi memorabilia. But <laughs> and and remember, all of your content is being sent off to this proprietary third party service, the Hive.ai, for them to analyze and train their AI. And that is and who like, knows what else they're doing with it. Well, they're selling that model. They're selling that service to other people as well, right? Mm. Um, you know, corporate clients want to know whether their staff are organising unions, for example. Uh, I'm sure that would never happen. Um, yeah, I mean, what what is happening here? And again, your content, your content, your communication, your private stuff. All right, it's public comments, but it's in that gray zone between publishing it in a newspaper or putting it on television and a private conversation with a friend on in, on, on a park bench. There is this gray zone, but there's assumption there's this assumption in the social networking world that that this is now public and you can do what you like with it. You can mine it for data, you can do it to sell ads. Now at one level, looking more broadly at this, 
people say, oh, it's about targeted ads. I started talking about BMWs and Toyotas, so I'm now going to see ads for a new car. I say, what's the harm in that? And the answer is, not a lot. On the other hand, if a change is detected uh, in what you're talking about, you start talking about alcohol more than you used to, you start complaining about back aches, your insurance company would love to know about that. Hmm. Um, it's it's stuff even that, that they can get from um, uh, your shopping habits, your your loyalty card in a supermarket. If, if someone who does the household shopping uh, and shifts from buying premium steak and top shelf brand your washing powder and all of that, uh, and suddenly goes to utility grade beef and instant coffee. It's like, well, maybe maybe your home loan provider would like that information. I'm reminded there was an infamous case in the US out of Target, I think it was, where they started pitching disposable nappies at a teenager uh, who hadn't, shall we say, told the parents that uh, there's a possibility that she might be pregnant, but uh, Target could work it out kind of by derivation. Absolutely. Um, You can tell uh, when a woman is pregnant from the change in her shopping list that scented body lotion becomes unscented, certain vitamins might blip up. Uh, any, 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 Any of you listening who, you know, are a parent will know how this works. Well, they well, in still, when customized... a man and a woman love each other very much, <laughs> yeah, I would have thought you'd podcast. know this by now. But <laughs> well, it's you know, it's not, it's not you know, broadly my department. But um, <laughs> sure, in 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 her weekly emails of <laughs> you know what was on special this week, she started getting you know disposable <laughs> nappies and baby lotion and all all of those things, and her father quite rightly kicked off because she was young. <laughs> He then had to apologise to Target uh, because, as he said, there were there were there were uh, uh, events and facts in in my household that I wasn't fully aware of. So now Target hasn't stopped doing that; they just used that was that sharp. was years ago, and that's not oh, that's a not a decade, new story. It's more than it? a decade yeah. ago, yeah. more than a decade ago. Um, uh, but they they now you know do chaff. They don't make it quite so latent that that's a thing. Um, but but certainly. I've I've noticed, uh, you know, in some of the emails I get from supermarkets, it's clear that they've collated information from one place with information in another place. Um, and we already have, like one of my favourite examples, and this came up uh, back in 2018, uh, journalist Ben Grubb uncovered this one. Mm. Uh, one of the big car manufacturers was targeting people whose phones – had been near a dealership for the other manufacturer for more than 10 minutes, say, and less than forever. Um, so if, if you're going to a car dealership and it's only 10 minutes, you might be picking up someone from work. You might be a courier dropping something off. If you're there for half an hour, you're probably looking at cars. If you're looking at cars, you're probably thinking of buying one. And if you're thinking of buying brand A, then brand B would like to show you some ads Saying why why brand B is better and will save you five thousand bucks. Now that's a, a thing that was happening in Australia five years ago. This is this is standard technology now. So what you're saying is that after this podcast, you're probably not going to get quite so much avocado advertising. I certainly hope so. So getting back to Blue Sky and looking at what they could or couldn't be doing different, forget King of England, we're making you King of Blue Sky for the day. What are you doing to not repeat the mistakes or to learn from Twitter and do better going forward? Well, I'd I'd get a good content moderation team up front and I'd, I'd get them talking to the many, many smart people in academia and analysis and so on who already know what all the traps are. Um. You know, Alex Stamos, who used to be head of this stuff over at Facebook, he kind of knows some stuff about that. He's at Stanford Uni now. He's well out of it, but he moderated content podcast people, if you want to understand all this stuff, and Australian Evelyn Duick is the co-host of that. Um, I'd, I'd pull back on getting any more people in until you've actually got in place first the policies about what kind of place you want to build. And then hmm. you get the developers 
to build that place or help you with automation to help your content moderators. Because I think we all know very well, particularly Australians with our uniquely Australian use of language on on these platforms, that when we get something flagged as inappropriate, that uh, an AI based on American speech or a minimum wage worker in Kenya or Costa Rica or the Philippines is not going to get the subtleties. Um, and, you know, that you need people on this. You need to build up your, your examples first. They're the, they're the big ones, but I think really, yeah, decide what it is that you're building. It's not a software platform. It's a social platform. And, and, and then, they're not decisions for engineers to make. Hell no. <laughs> I, I, I would say it even more strongly on this podcast, except you'll then get a content flag on it. Um, <laughs> no, you don't want engineers doing that. Now, assuming uh, Joe Graber's a, a, a good developer, I don't know. The main project before this was the Zcash cryptocurrency, so that is already telling me a little bit about her worldview. But maybe she's a good developer. I'll assume she is. She got the gig. Make her chief technology officer. But the technology has to be subservient to the social good. And I know there will be some people listening to this and go, oh, why are you making all this political? And I go, mate, you are literally building a system to decide what information people can and cannot see in their own communication. There's very little that's more political than that. So make the technology serve the people, not serving the people to the technology. Absolutely. Particularly in this case, as the technology seems to be feeding an AI so that advertisers can have their content tagged and put ads next to it. That is not what society is. I now say again, there's nothing wrong with advertising in and of itself. It's the way in which it's done as part of surveillance capitalism and the assumption that surveillance capitalism is the only way to build things. Oh, and also, given that Americans are only 4% of the world's population, Americans only 4% of the staff of this organisation at the senior level. Cool. Well, right. um, we'll let you know how the job interview goes. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, Don't call us, gonna, we'll call It's you. not going to happen, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'll uh, show myself out. So this week was Google I.O. And uh, there was a lot of news coming out of that one. But in fact, to cover this, I'm going to have to jump into the vertical hold TARDIS. Adam, can you just excuse me for a second? Go for it. So this week has seen Google I.O. In fact, by the time you're listening to this, Google I.O. will have already happened. And we're doing a little bit of time travel here at Vertical Hold again because I'm actually recording this the week before Google I.O. I'm sat here with uh, Adam Smith from Reviews.org. Hello, hello. And Dan Tyson from EFTM. Hi, how are you going? And gentlemen, we've just had the briefing on the, let's call it the Australian aspects of Google I.O. that we know of. And obviously, there is this time travel problem that there may well be, shall we say, secret things that Google announces at Google I.O. that we don't know about yet. As they are want to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's very much their style. Um, first, and most, first and foremost, obviously, the Pixel 7a, which is coming to Australia and is coming to Australia uh, particularly quickly, shall we say. Um, Dan, what's your impressions there? Yeah, it's a, basically, a, a, well, another one in the line of their A-series phones, so more and longer their affordable line, but they're doing a few things to make it a little bit more premium this year, so they're upgrading some of the, the buttons to metal buttons, they're making it a little bit more durable and stuff like that, so good stuff hardware-wise, it comes down to the software features with all the Pixel stuff, though. <laughs> and the, the price, admittedly, seems somewhat more premium than with previous A-series releases, uh, which... Yeah, I guess my question is how how big of a price gulf is there between the 7A and the 7, and uh, then how big of a hardware gulf is there between the two to justify the uh, the somewhat minimal price gulf, I guess. Well, I think that comparison is a really interesting one, and 
off the top of my head and without having already tested the phone itself, although by the time, again, by the time you read this, I think we all will have, um, it would appear to actually favour, to my view, the 7a. It would seem like the 7 doesn't seem like such a great purchase. Am I on the mm. wrong track there? No, not at all. It's just, you're actually getting all of last year's hardware, so you're getting the Tensor G2 processor, you're getting a similar amount of RAM, uh, 8 gig on this one, 128 gig or 256 gig storage, if you want to pay a bit more. So it's, it's getting the sort of specs that you get from the 7, but with a slightly cheaper price tag. Um, so... I mean, 64 megapixel camera sensor on it, which is slightly better than the one on the Pixel 7. So, yeah, it's coming down hardware-wise on the side of the Pixel 7a. The other big hardware thing that we will see here, although not until I think it's June the 20th, June 20th. Um, is the Pixel tablet. Now, Dan, we've talked to you on the show before about Pixel hardware or Google tablet hardware, as I think it was at one point as well, uh, before, but, but none of it was coming to Australia. This one we will see. What's new about the Pixel tablet? So the Pixel tablet's a new thing that they're sort of doing as a design that's going to be helpful in the home. So it has a charging dock that it's designed to always sit on where it won't overcharge the battery. It's got home hubs so it can access all your smart home stuff. It's got all your tablet stuff which has now been optimised apparently, which we have heard this story from Google before. So we're, I think we're all being burned <laughs> once, twice, three, possibly more times on, on tablets from Google. But we'll see how the Pixel tablet goes. <laughs> And visually, Adam, this thing looks a lot like the, the Nest. Despite, it sure it? does. It sure does. And, and at the same time, uh, Google is saying that it's not meant to be a replacement for the Nest display. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see the use case sort of for the Nest display versus this. You know, like um, what, what are the functions it can perform that, uh, that the Nest can perform that this can't that would make both of them sort of a, a like a, a purchasing option for someone like I I guess I just don't quite understand where this leaves the Google Nest display so part of it was the they really were focusing it on the, the Pixel Nest Hub is really something as a fixed display, so it doesn't move. Something good to have in the corner in the kitchen. Whereas the hub, the Pixel Tablet is really being marketed as like a, a home device that you can sort of have sitting there. One of the big things is that home hub, so giving you fast access to your smart home devices, which they've said is only coming to Android tablets, specifically starting with the Pixel Tablet. It won't be coming to the um, Nest Hub devices. So that sort of seems to where they're making that distinction. I would have said the other big thing, though, is much more evidently, this is an Android tablet. Mm -hmm. You can throw your apps onto it in a way that you can't on the Nest, despite the Nest plays a lot simpler, and it's got yep. to said, a fair bit cheaper too. Oh, definitely. Um, the, the, the Nest Hub has always been one of those things where it's, it's, it's just easy access to things, but it has limits, whereas the Pixel tablet seems to be breaking those limits and, and extending towards more what Android can do. The other thing that they alluded to that we did not see here and that we will not see in Australia at this time, I will say, we're in Google HQ, I don't want to say too much because I might not leave the front door <laughs> safely, uh, was, of course, the, the Pixel Fold, Google's foldable phone. Yeah, I think a bit of disappointment in the room uh, when they, they didn't announce it coming to Australia, but a uh, lot of interest in folding phones. Just very disappointed in not coming here. <laughs> yeah, and, and considering the... Uh, robust information we've gotten out of leaks it doesn't feel like there's a like a lot left to surprise us about the pixel fold which makes it kind of strange surprise, to me that we you're didn't, not getting it exactly that, <laughs> that, that was really the only big surprise in the room um but uh, yeah it makes it strange to me that we didn't talk about it a bit more yeah google's always been a bit funny about their their, their regional marketing for, for hardware releases and despite the fact they're announcing it and we probably will see it soon sooner rather than later uh, we won't get any information ahead of time so unfortunately in our future selves uh, we'll know more about yeah. this the the uh the disappointing thing for me is i that means that i'm going to have to wait even longer to conduct my stress test where i see how much taco meat it will hold versus a <laughs> galaxy fold so okay now now i'm intrigued by this uh, obvious useful benchmark. How much taco meat can a Galaxy Fold hold and does it vary by Galaxy Fold generation? Well see that's the thing is I because I haven't had anything to benchmark it against I haven't conducted the test yet and I also haven't found a Galaxy Fold owner who's willing to allow me to fill their phone with taco meat. Maybe so. the Oppo into Flip. You could just do. You could just do a, a mini taco. Version. That's that's. I'd say that's more like a bow. 
<laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Dan. Now, Dan, you have done the show before, Adam. You have not, so you know what's coming and you don't. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> the vertical hold three questions of doom. I will ask Dan first so you get an idea for what it is okay. that you've got to do. Uh, I'll ask all three questions. You can answer them in any order that you like. Where can people find your work online, Dan? Where can they find you on social media? And given we're sitting in Google HQ, what's your favourite ever Google product? Oh, okay. Oh, and, and that's a hard question for me. Uh, so you can find me writing online at EFTM.com. You can find me all over social media, Frog Hollow. That's with a PH. And my favourite Google product, probably the, it's a toss-up between either the Nexus 5, which is one of the most best design phones ever. The other one is the Google Clips. A very, very forgotten device which Tate took AI photos whenever it decided the photo looked good. I'm glad you described it because I was thinking Google Clips, Google Clips, I'm sure I should remember that one, but I just don't. There's so many. And like the early days of AI, it didn't really work. <laughs> and it's still your favourite because? It's just weird. <laughs> Okay, Adam, and exactly the same question. Um, yes, so for me, uh, you can find me on uh, reviews.org slash au. Uh, ever so often, also whistleout.com.au. Uh, social media, you will not find me particularly active anywhere, as I generally just spend my time doom-scrolling Reddit. Uh, favorite Pixel or Google device? Uh, look, the 7 Pro is my everyday phone, and I really, really like it. The one thing that uh, I liked better about the 6 Pro, which was my everyday for phone before this, is it was uh, it was more slippery, and I liked to see it sort of edging its way off the arm of the couch and like, look that little guy go. It just kind of gave me a warm feeling every time it would try and escape. I'm getting this feeling you have a slightly fatalistic relationship with smartphones here, Adam. Yes. <laughs> I have a feeling he needs two to race them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make that happen. Thanks, gents. Thank you. Thanks. So, Alex, now that we're back in the present and you've had a bit of time to play with the Pixel 7a, uh, how does it impress you? Does it live up to your expectations? So this is pretty rare for me because it actually exceeded my expectations. I kind of thought, ah, oh, they're just going for the kind of average spec bump and it's still the lesser of the species. But actually, at its price and for what I've tested it for, it's probably the best mid-range phone and possibly the best value phone you can buy right now. And I don't say those words lightly. I test a lot of phones, and this has got a lot of competition to beat. So from the conversation we just had, should the oh, the conversation we just listened to, should the 7A be cheaper or should the 7 be more expensive? Like, where's the, the gap's not right here? Well, I think the, seven, the only thing really for the 7 is that it's got that slightly bigger screen if you really, really need that. But I think the 7A is actually a really nice, hand-friendly size. It works really well. The cameras are good. The battery life is really good, better than I've seen on 7, and that's kind of critical. The processing power is exactly the same because it's exactly the same in it. So I think the only reason to buy the 7 is if I suppose you see it, and I have seen a few places starting to sell it off, uh, cheaply. If you see it cheaper than the 7A, otherwise I'd go the 7A. Um, and I think for a lot of people, and this has been the case for those flagship phones for a long while, actually, for a lot of people, a flagship phone has more power than you need. And the other reason to pick up a flagship phone really is the cameras. There's still a bit of a dividing line there because there's no actual optical zoom lens on the 7A, for example. Although, again, the Super Res Zoom actually works really, really well in most situations. So I would think from the other handsets I've been looking at lately that maybe the Samsung Galaxy A54 would be the one you'd put up against this? Yeah, well, I've, I've actually done just that. I mean, if the listeners are interested, uh, they can actually read my full review at alexreviewstech.com. Subtle plug there. What was that uh, URL again? That was alexreviewstech.com. Thanks for asking, Adam. And... Uh, and I put it up against the A54 specifically because they're very much in that same kind of price bracket. You could also consider something like Apple's um, iPhone SE third gen. That's the same kind of price point as well. And the thing is, in just about every aspect, this thing does better. So this does better than the A54 for low light shooting, for example. That's really clear and evident. And it's more powerful. The iPhone, the SE, is more powerful again, but I don't know that people need that. And it's got much, much worse battery life where this thing's got really good, very easy all day, maybe even two days if you're only a moderate user kind of battery life. It's a really, really good value proposition. Well, that just about wraps up this week's app of Vertical Hold. Thanks to Silgarian for joining us. 
Oh, my pleasure. And now it's time, as it usually is, for the patented, royalty-free vertical hold, three questions of doom. <laughs> I'll ask all three. You can answer them in any order you like, although nearly everyone does it in the same order. Where can people find your work online? Where can they find you on whatever social media you might choose to inhabit? Maybe even Blue Sky. And what's the favourite art? What? No, I keep getting this question wrong. I just keep phrasing it wrong. It's annoying me. Have you thought of writing it down? And of all... Well, <laughs> nah, I don't know if you're right. <laughs> and of all the articles, opinion columns, and everything else you've ever written, what's your favourite piece? Well, uh, Stilgarian is my name, and just punch that into all the things on the on the Googles and the Twitters and the Mastodons. And I am on Blue Sky, but I haven't said anything yet. Um, Google will work out how to spell it. It's all there. Look out for my podcast, The 9pm Edict, in your favourite podcast app. As for article, this was I knew this question was coming up, and it's quite hard. I'm I'm going to throw in, in fact, a set of articles. I mentioned the 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 car manufacturer ad targeting thing. That story was a story written by Ben Grubb, but that was part of a feature uh, that I did for Crikey back in 2018 called Prying Eyes. It was a bit of an in-depth. Yeah, about 15, 20 articles about surveillance capitalism. I was the series editor um, and wrote some of the stories. And I'm just really happy with the way that all came together. Uh, if you Google crikey prying eyes, you'll find it right up top. I'm pretty sure they're all unlocked now. Um, that was fun. It's always nice when you can produce that kind of that, that really great piece of work. I do know exactly what you mean. Mm. And, and and it still always, stands up, quite frankly. You know, it's it's still a thing you can read today and go, Oh wow, they're doing that. Because they're still doing it, yeah. Because they're still doing it. <laughs> and <laughs> and as always, you can catch us online at Vertical Hold AU on Twitter. Not yet on Blue Sky, but we are on Instagram, the Vertical Hold Facebook page, and on the web at verticalhold.com.au. And thanks, everyone, for braving the cybers to listen in this week. Don't forget to drop us a line and let us know what you think about what we talked about this week and what we could do better in 2023. 